What reason is there for the Federal Reserve to even be considering cutting interest rates at this point? Well, uh, I'll, I'll stick with your direct question. What is the reason to think about cutting rates? And the reason is that inflation has actually come down quite a bit, um, which has meant that real interest rates are higher now than rates were when we had extremely uh, high inflation, that's seven, eight, nine percent. So that's the reason for them to think about cutting. Now, that said, I will tell you, um, you know, what I've been saying for at least six months, maybe longer, is that it is going to be the hardest part of this is going to be bringing the last bit of inflation down, getting us back towards two percent instead of being in the threes. Um, and then the second is that the Fed is going to hold rates high longer than people expect. They've actually been telling us they were going to do this, so we should adjust our expectations and expect it. But I think that it was sort of hard for people to wrap their head around the idea of what it would mean to bring them up and hold, hold, hold. And what that means is holding longer than sort of traditional calculations would suggest uh, they should hold, which means a period of very high uh, real interest rates, which is where we are right now. So what does holding longer than mean, Betsy, for the labor market that has been so resilient through an historic series of increases? Does the Fed still risk destroying this job market? Uh, you know, I, I think destroying is too harsh of a word. I think they can move pretty quickly. Um, and there's no sign of a labor market that's even really fundamentally weakening, let alone being destroyed. I think what they have to worry about is what will it take to bring inflation down the rest of the way? And will inflation actually take off and become a little bit faster? So I think they're going to be studying this data incredibly carefully. And I, one of the things I don't think they want to do is cut rates and then turn around and raise them again. And so that's why I think that they're going to hold longer than people want them to hold or than expect them to hold is because they're going to be thinking about what's the risk of cutting. And the risk of cutting is that they need to uh, raise rates again. Now, of course, as you point out, the risk of not cutting is that the labor market cools too quickly. Um, and, you know, that that's the thing that they're they're trying to balance. Look, if you look at the price increases we just saw, one of the things that's going on is shelter inflation remains high. And I'll tell you what, if if governments around the country want to see inflation come down, what they need to do is ease the regulations that constrain the housing supply. The best way we could fight inflation right now would be to expand housing supply uh, quickly and effortlessly, which is going to mean removing a lot of those not in my backyard, those NIMBY regulations that slow down markets ability to increase housing supply when there's demand for it. Of course, addressing housing and housing affordability is something that came up both in President Biden's State of the Union speech as well as in the budget that he presented yesterday, as did uh, support for for labor, for workers. And we actually caught up with the labor secretary, the acting one, at least, Julie Su, here on Balance of Power yesterday and asked her specifically about the wage gains we have seen for employees, employees, including union members, and what that might mean for inflation. Take a listen. People have also always said, too, right, you can't have uh, higher wages and control inflation. But the numbers don't lie. I mean, this is Bidenomics. This is this is this has happened. And we want to see real wage increases because more money in workers' pockets is a good thing. I don't think that we have to choose between uh, people, families paying uh, prices that they can afford and getting wages that are going to allow them uh, to, to feel some security. It's a false choice. Is it really a false choice, Professor? You know, I, I, there's some really important subtle things here to think about. Um, one is that inflation is about the generalized rise in all prices. So if we were thinking about incomes, a generalized rise in all incomes. But we could have a change in who gets the income, relative income. And what we've seen is the wages in the bottom and the middle have risen relative to the wages at the top. That's a compression of wages, a reduction in inequality. That's not going to fuel inflation. 
it it certainly helps people at the bottom. It might be frustrating to people at the top who are seeing some of whom are seeing their wages eroded eroded by inflation. But we've had decades of rising inequality, and I think it's nothing short of a miracle that we've actually seen some reduction in that inequality. The other thing we've seen is a shift where more of the income that's produced in society as we in in American society as we produce things has gone to the investors and the owners of capital and not to the workers. So we could shift some of that income from capital to labor, which would just be a, a reduction or a return to the uh, historic labor share of income. That's also not going to fuel wages, uh, fuel inflation, mm -hmm. excuse me. So that's the sense in which it is a false choice. Obviously, if, if all wages are sort of going up and that's causing um, you know, employers to raise their prices, that's how you get that kind of wage price spiral. But we've seen no sign of that. And I think it's because of the two dynamics I just mentioned, that shifting relative wages and that shift in compensation between capital and labor. We only have a minute left, Betsy. If wages are outpacing inflation at the time people vote, will Joe Biden be reelected? You know, all the historic data says yes, but I have to tell you, these are not normal times. And so I'm right. not going to get into that prediction. I mean, obviously, he's delivered a really strong economy, but obviously people are still frustrated. I think they're frustrated about the fact that, you know, they're facing higher interest rates, uh, they're facing higher food prices, and they've just seen a period of, you know, sort of decades of economic change that has been really unsettling for large groups of the population. And what we're going to need to see is, you know, can Biden convince people who have felt unmoored that they, that they can trust him to build an economy they can thrive in?